name is Tristan Higby and I camp and travel in my 2011 Toyota RAV4. I wanted something small that got good gas mileage. I also wanted a Toyota that is known for reliability and I could have gotten a minivan. I was considering Toyota Sienna's but the RAV4 has a little bit better ground clearance and a shorter wheelbase and this one is actually four-wheel drive so it's better going off-road and getting into harder to reach places. So let's start off with the tour with uh, looking at the inside. I think this is really the heart of it right here. This is where I go in and, and get out of the car um, when I'm sleeping at night. You can see the, um, the back row seat, seats here, the middle seat, it just folded down and it's completely flat and I just have a couple of a couple of camping mattresses on top of that and a, and a sleeping bag. The bed is always set up. It's constantly in place. All I have to do when I pull up to a campsite at night is push this, the front seat forward, the driver's seat forward. That gives me an extra, I don't know, eight or nine inches of space. And then, yeah, the back is, is all, ready to, all ready to go. I can crawl right in. As far as comfort goes, I think it's comfortable on a scale of one to 10. It's probably six or seven. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world, but as far as camping goes, it's so much nicer than sleeping in a tent. I tent camped for several years and I hated having to, to set up the tent and break it down, especially if it was raining, having to deal with a big wet ball of nylon and trying to stuff that back into, into a bag, into a stuff sack. Really hated that. It's comfortable. I guess when you're sleeping in a vehicle, it's as comfortable as the mattress that you have. And here I have two camping mattresses, which are okay. They're kind of cheap. One's a foam one and one is a, a one and a half inch self-inflating pad. And I used to have a, a much thicker three inch, inch inflatable mattress and that was really comfortable. But my fiance's roommate's dog chewed it up. And so I had to get a, get a much cheaper and more readily available setup. The only problem with this setup initially when I first bought it was that when the, the front seat is pushed forward all the way and the back seat is folded down, there's a gap. There's a gap right here between the, 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 the top of the folded down back seat and the back of the front seat. And I'm tall enough that my head and shoulders would fall into that gap. So I needed a way to bridge that gap. In the past, I've, uh, I've used a cooler and a couple of bins stacked on top of each other to, to fill that gap, to bridge the gap. And that worked well, but I didn't like having to keep moving things around if I wanted to get into the cooler or if I wanted to get into the bins. So what I ended up doing was getting a piece of of plywood from Home Depot and cutting it to size. It's maybe two feet by two feet and it's not attached to the to the seat or anything like that. It's just a piece of plywood with a hole drilled in two of the corners and then there's uh, some paracord and a little keychain carabiner is also from Home Depot that act as suspension. The paracord goes up and around the uh, the posts that keep the the headrest up and so that way when I move the front seat forward the gap is filled with the, with the piece of plywood there and I can put weight on it when my body weight is on there it, uh, it stays in place nicely and it doesn't bend but I can still have storage space underneath the plywood platform there for whatever uh, I usually put my shoes down under there. As far as storage goes in a small space like this, you really have to make use of every little inch of, of storage space that you have. That includes things like the seat back pockets, the spaces underneath the seats, all of the little cubbies on the doors, and uh, just every little inch of space that you have. I'm 5'10 or 5'11 on a good day, and when I'm stretching out in the back here, I still have two or three inches of, of space. And on the storage front, as far as storage goes, uh, I found that there were little spaces in the car that there were just dead space that I could use to, to store things. And so I ended up making my own little little bags that attach to different handles and uh, fill up any empty space here. So I have a bag on the, the side handle of the door here. I have a bag on the back of the headrest here. I have a bag hanging here between the, uh, the two seats. I have bags all over the place. Basically, if I could attach a bag to something, I, I made a bag to, to put there. I made all the bags myself. I designed them myself. As I put them on my YouTube channel, other people started to ask me about where I got them and how I made them. 
And so I ended up just uh, starting an online store and selling them to other people. When I pull up to a campsite at the end of the day, if I'm camped in the, just in the middle of nowhere, sometimes I don't really care if the windows are covered. If I am camped in relative proximity to other people or if there's a road that passes by the campsite, uh, I'll put down my curtains and then I also have some inserts that go into the windows here. So on the side doors for these two rear doors on the side, I, uh, I made some some curtains that come down. They're just made out of ripstop nylon. I think I just googled black ripstop nylon and found a store and, and ordered them. So the side curtains come down like that and when I roll the when I roll these side windows down at night I have mosquito netting in here semi-permanently held in with magnets so I can just pull up to the campsite roll the windows down and uh, I'm comfortable to, to sleep for the night. And then for the other windows I store the inserts in the back here. Underneath the mattress, underneath the mattresses I have I cut a set of window coverings out of Reflectix. This is I think one $10 roll of Reflectix from Home Depot. I cut these out myself, I measured them myself. I, I think I just uh, got some cardboard or some butcher paper, traced the outline of the windows and then cut, uh, cut some Reflectix to size. I also have another set made out of black poster board. Uh, I made these first and then made the Reflectix ones later. I use the black if I, in case I ever am boondocking uh, in a more urban area or I don't want people to know that there's someone sleeping or camping inside uh, the SUV. As far as the difference between these two go, uh, the Reflectix is definitely better in when it's really sunny and hot. Uh, it helps reflect a lot of the, the sunlight back. In cold weather, I imagine it makes a little bit of a difference, but when it's 15 or 20 degrees outside, these really don't make that much of a difference. It's still gonna be really cold inside the SUV. All of these are stored just underneath the bed here. I just lift it up. This is the foot of the bed. Uh, my feet are, are at the, the back end of the, of the RAV4 and my head is up by the, the driver's seat. Once you've cut the Reflectix to size, it's pretty easy to stick it in. You just kind of pressure fit the edges in. I put these up. I'd say about 90% of the time that I'm camping. Sometimes I don't, like I said, sometimes I'm just either feeling too lazy or I feel like there's no one else around and uh, I don't care if someone sees me that I'm in there. But you have to keep in mind the moon and the sun. If it's a full moon outside and if you don't want all that bright light shining in, you should put your window coverings up. Also, depending on the time of year, if it gets dark or if it gets light really early in the morning or stays light late in the day, you want to put these in to make sure you don't get too much sunlight in your face first thing in the morning. So as you can imagine, space and storage is, is really important when you're living in a, in a space as small as this. I built a shelf in the back of my, my car here. Uh, it's just built from a couple of one by twos that hold up a top shelf. And then there's a, there's a plastic bin kind of suspended below the shelf. I can lift up the top of the shelf and access it from the inside, access the, the contents of the bin from when I'm inside uh, the car. So when I initially wanted to buy a vehicle to sleep in, to camp in, to travel in, I was looking at vans and trucks and SUVs, and there was a lot of information out there about how to, how to do that in, in those other vehicles. Obviously, van life is a big thing. Truck camping has been a thing for a long time. But as far as SUV camping goes, there wasn't all that much information out there. And so it was really left up to me to figure out the best way to, to do it, the best way to store everything, to sleep in here, and to travel and make sure it all works together and I don't get too overwhelmed by everything. As far as storage goes with an SUV, with traveling in an SUV, there are really two ways to do it. First, you can build a platform that comes up above the ground it has drawers in it. And then the upside to that is that you have a lot of storage space. The downside is that it cuts into your headroom. You can't really sit up. The other option, the one that I like better that I came up with for this is to build a shelf in the back. And so with a shelf in the back here, my legs fit underneath the shelf and I have plenty of storage space, but I can still sit up. I still have plenty of headroom. When I first got into sleeping in this car after I bought it, I was really excited to try to figure out all the different things that would that would work for me and so I bought all sorts of gear and I ended up not using a lot of that. Like if you compare the gear that I traveled with then, which was about three years ago, to the gear that I have now, 
I don't know if anything is the same. A lot of the stuff is different. And so my advice to someone starting out is to start with nothing and then add to it as you need to. So get your car, or truck, or whatever, it doesn't matter what you're traveling in, any vehicle, figure out how you can sleep in it, and then go onto freecampsites.net, find a campsite that's close by, and go camping for a night or two. And then that's the best way to really figure out what exactly you need and what you don't. Things that I tried in the past, uh, showers were a big thing. I needed to figure out how to, how to shower when I was on the road. I had an anytime fitness membership for a while, and that would let me use the showers inside of the, of the gym. But I realized that when I travel, I like to be in remote places. And there are no gyms in the middle of the desert or on, in the for national forest or on top of mountains. So that didn't really work for me. I made a shower out of a big spray bottle, like a weed killer spray bottle. But that was just took up too much space. And for the amount that I used it, which was maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, I didn't like having it on top of the shelf here. It was just unused space. It was just an unused item taking up space most of the time. And so I then tried solar showers, which are the rubber bags that you can fill up and put in the sun and then hang from a tree or something. And I really liked that, but then I didn't know what I would do if there weren't any trees around, like if I was in the desert. And so there are just all these little things that you need to work through. And it, and it really just depends on, on where you're going, how much time you're spending out camping, and what your personal preferences are, what your comfort level is with camping and with the gear that you want to have with you. I've toyed with the idea of, of making my own road shower. So there's a company called Road Shower that makes this like black aluminum cylinder that you can strap to the top of your, of your vehicle, and that looks really cool, but it's a few hundred dollars. I've toyed with the idea of getting a, a black piece of PVC or ABS, filling it with water and putting it on there, but I just don't really need to. I think that simpler is better, and I liked the I like the simplicity of the little solar showers. And uh, as you can see, I have a lot of stuff on the roof of my of my car, and just another thing, another big black tube on there. It's just another thing to deal with, another thing to put on and take off between trips. And I just didn't want to mess with that. As for storage in the back here, I've got the shelf in the bin under the shelf are my clothes. I can access those by lifting up the top of the shelf. For clothing, it's really just personal preference. Sometimes I, I go on a week-long trip with just a few pairs of shirts and uh, a few pairs of pants and a few shirts. On this particular trip, right now I'm in the middle of a month-long trip. I have a lot of clothes in here because I don't want to go to the laundromat more than I have to. And so I have probably, I think I have probably six normal daytime t-shirts. I have probably another five or six hiking shirts. I hike a lot and I don't want to uh, get my nicer shirts gross and have to, having to keep changing out my shirts a couple times a day. I generally travel with two or three pairs of pants and one or two pairs of shorts and then uh, maybe six or eight pairs of socks and then uh, about the same pieces of laundromat. For dirty clothes, I have a mesh bag and I just put my dirty clothes in there and then I put the bag up in the cargo box up here so I don't have to mess with it in my living space. And then in these two bins, I have various items. The, the general theme of this bin is cleaning items. So I have my little solar shower in here. I have laundry, soap, and I have um, some toilet gear in here, some, some sanitary bags and some trash bags and some kitty litter, things like that. In this bin, I just have a few items that I need easy access to. So a spare paper towel roll, uh, some plastic cutlery, some camera gear, basically just whatever doesn't fit anywhere else, but I need to be able to access it pretty pretty easily. I put that in this bin. Along with showering, the bathroom is another big piece of the puzzle that you need to figure out when you're living like this. Again, I've gone through a bunch of different iterations of, of what I like to do. If I'm really just out in the middle of nowhere, I have a little shovel in, uh, in the storage, in cold storage down here that I, I'll just dig a hole and poop in the woods. It's not that complicated. If, uh, if I'm somewhere where I don't want to do that or I can't do that, I have a little toilet that I made right here. These are items that I use a lot. I've got table, chairs, privacy tent for shower, and so these are just held on with some buckles up on top. And I struggled with a long time to figure out the best toilet solution. Again, kind of like with the shower, I didn't want something that was super big and bulky that I only used occasionally. Because when possible, I like to just go into a gas station or Walmart or a grocery store or a fast food restaurant and use the bathroom there. If I can't do that, then I need another solution. And for that, I made this. So this is a, this is a camp stool that also works as a toilet.
So this was just a regular camp stool. I cut the fabric part off the top, then I sewed a couple pieces of two inch wide webbing here. And so you can sit on it just like, just like a regular chair, just like a regular stool, and it's comfortable, it's fine. You know, if you're sitting around a campfire or whatever, but if you need to use it as a toilet, these two outside lengths of webbing slide off, slide off to the side. And then these two middle ones expand. In the bin up here, I have a couple of small trash bags. I put a trash bag in here, kind of fan out the edges, sit down on it, do my business, and then I can, I can pour some kitty litter in there. I have a bottle of kitty litter just so that it doesn't smell too much. And then I can tie up the bag and put it into a Ziploc bag or two and then toss that up also into the big cargo box up here so it's out of my way, out of my life. And then if I pass a dumpster or a trash somewhere, I can just toss it. It's the most compact thing that I could think of that's also multi-use. That's another big pillar of living in a base as small as this. You need something, you need things that are multi-use. Again, I didn't want a toilet I only used once or twice a week, taking up all sorts of space in here. So this thing, you saw how small that package is when it's all put into its little bag. It's tiny, barely takes up any space, and it's multi-use, it's multi-purpose. This thing is a $15 little backpacking chair from Walmart. It's a much heavier and cheaper version of a much more expensive uh, kind of chair that you can get from a place like REI. But I've had this for over a year now and it works really well. Uh, for $15, it's a great little chair. I really like it. This is a small table that I bought from Amazon. It, uh, it's about maybe 16 inches square on top and about a foot high when it's all set up. Here in a little bit, I'll set this up and show you how all of these things work together, the chair and the table and everything else. Uh, but there's another little chair and another little table and then shower privacy tent. Again, we'll go into more depth about all those things later. And then moving down in the back here, these are two long plastic bins. I originally had one taller bin, a single bin here, but I realized that I wanted more uh, more division between the things in there, so now I have two separate ones. These are from Walmart, about $10 each. I think they're made for under bed storage. But um, this one here has my kitchen gear, my camping, my camp cooking gear. This one down here has miscellaneous items. I have some camera gear and some batteries and straps and just whatever other miscellaneous camping gear that doesn't really fit anywhere else is in that bottom one. And then on the door here, there's this little net that uh, has a few things in it. I have a hatchet that I use for, for pounding in uh, tent stakes for my tarp, which we can talk about more later, my, my awning tarp, and for the, the freestanding shower privacy tent. And then I have, um, this is a tarp, or this is the tarp that I was just referring to that turns into an awning. And then this is a little bag of tent stakes right here. And then there's more storage underneath here. In order to access it, you have to take out these two, these two bins. I call this area my cold storage. It's gear that I don't need to access very often. So there are things like, uh, so I have climbing gear in here. I have emergency gear. I have um, there's other things that I still want to have with me on a trip that I don't need to access very often. Just uh, basically things that I may want to use but not, don't necessarily have to access every day. This is the bin that has the, just the miscellaneous gear in it. I have a folder in here that has maps and pamphlets from all the places that I've been, you know, Grand Canyon, Capitol Reef National Park. I like to go to national parks and national monuments, and so whenever I get a map or a, a flyer or brochure of information from the visitor center, I put it in here. I have these three smaller bins that help me organize some of my electronics. I have some some tripods and other gear, some little little tripods and other gear in here. Here I have a spare camera and some spare camera batteries. And in, in here I have some other electronics, things like, uh, like external USB battery packs and um, extension cord and things like that. On this side, we've got a map, just miscellaneous items again, another outlet splitter, paracord, batteries, stuff sacks, a fan. Again, just little camping things that, uh, that I need to have but don't need to be super easily accessible. This other bin here is the cooking gear, my camp kitchen, and we'll cover that in a minute when we set up camp. 
So I sleep on the driver's side of the car and then the passenger side of the car is basically all storage. In the middle back here next to where my my upper body is, this is my food storage area. I have a cooler right here. This is a Coleman Extreme 58, I think. It's like a $40 cooler, but it's a really good cooler. It uh, I've had ice in here last for eight or nine days. Uh, I think it's actually, I know this is, might be heresy to say this, but it's actually kind of comparable to a Yeti. Definitely not as good looking or as sexy or as durable, as tough, but ice in here lasts a long time. I'm, I've been really happy with it, been really impressed with it. For the cold storage inside the cooler, I generally put two 10 pound bags or blocks of ice in there. I prefer the blocks of ice because they last longer, but they're a bit harder to find. So right now, for example, I just have two 10 pound bags of ice in there. And I, I'm not really super into cooking. I don't do anything too crazy. So I just have the basics in here. I have butter, I have cheese, I have deli meats for making sandwiches, a little bottle of pesto, things that are easy to, easy to handle that have a relatively long shelf life if they're in a cooler and won't get destroyed instantly if, if some water gets on them. For eating out, if I'm in a city, if I go through a city, I'll probably stop and get something to eat. But a lot of the time I am out in more remote places, so I make my own food when I'm out there. It's just easier if I'm passing through a city to get a quick bite from a fast food place and I don't have to deal with cook or make anything. On top of the cooler here, we have two smaller little plastic bins. This is my dry storage. This is food that doesn't need to be refrigerated and won't melt too badly if, uh, if it's just left out in the heat. I tend to have things in here like, like right here you can see some fruit cups and some fruit snacks and granola bars and triscuits, fruit, things like that. That's basically all I have in here. These two bins on top and this is all of my food right here. I don't have food really anywhere else in the car. It's mostly just kept right here. Sometimes if I, if I know I have a long drive coming up, I'll grab a granola bar or two and keep them in the front seat with me. But otherwise, all the food is just right here. Right behind the cooler is my trash bag. It's just a shopping bag. This one, this one is from Walmart and it's held on to the, the posts that hold the headrest up by a couple of little keychain carabiners. If I fill this up and I'm still out in the middle of nowhere and can't get rid of it, I will tie up the top and again, toss it up into the cargo box. If I am somewhere close to civilization, if I pass a gas station or a, a fast food place or a Walmart or a grocery store, I'll tie up the bag and then toss it into the, into the little trash uh, bins that are there. And above that, I have a Kleenex box and uh, that's held onto the back of the headrest with a little custom harness thing that I made. I found that I always liked having paper towels and Kleenex within arm's reach basically from wherever I am in the car. And so the, the Kleenex is here and the paper towels are up in the front seat. The paper towels are on a little PVC rod with some webbing through it and again those attached to the posts that hold up the headrest. On the passenger seat here I have a few things that uh, again that I like to have easy access to, things that I use often. There is a, a cheap little seat cover that covers the whole seat so that it doesn't get too too gross if I put something muddy on there or that uh, so that it doesn't get indentations, the seat doesn't get indentations on it if I put things on top of it. I have this little basket here that holds some of my camera gear, uh, a binder that has some travel information for me for my upcoming places in it. I also have a little, keep a little uh, record or log or journal of my trips. And so I have information in here about my campsites, where they are, how much money I spend, the mileage I cover every day. I know that all of this might seem really cramped and cluttered and messy to people, but it's not. Everything has its place. Every, I know exactly where things go. And at the end of every day, if things do get a little bit messy, before I get into bed for the night, I make sure everything is all tidy and is where it's supposed to be. Again, when you're in a space this small, it can get out of hand quickly. Um, it can, <laughs> your items can expand to fill up the space pretty quickly. And so there's plenty of room for me to do everything I need to do in here. Plenty of room for me when I'm driving, plenty of room for me when I'm sleeping, but basically all the other space is taken up by something. And that said, you don't need all of this stuff. Again, just throw a backpack with some camping gear in it and you can sleep inside your car. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. But I found that for my personal comfort and for the, for the things that I like to do, it's better to have all these little things that help make the experience 
uh, more enjoyable for me and easier for me when I'm on the road. In front of the passenger seat here on the floor is where basically all of my water is. I think I have about seven or eight gallons of water at all times. If I go too far below four or five, I'll top it off to make sure I always have a lot of water on me or in my car. I travel to pretty remote places. I'm in the desert a lot. I want to make sure that if my car breaks down or I'm stuck out somewhere, I won't die in a day from lack of water. I have several days uh, worth of supplies with me all the time so that even if something bad does happen, I can survive and, and be okay. And so I have one large four gallon jug of water here. That's basically my emergency water. I don't touch it much just because it's kind of a pain to handle it and to pour it into smaller jugs. For my day-to-day -day use, I have about two of these three liter bottles and then I have a one one gallon jug back in here. I also have a few of the smaller one liter bottles and I use the I use the one liter, liter bottles when I'm hiking. I take two or three with me on a day hike. I use these to refill the one liter bottles and then if I need to I will refill these larger bottles with the the bigger four gallon jug but again I try not to do that if I don't have to. I fill up the water a lot at visitor centers and national parks or national monuments. A lot of times they're great places to get information, and to go to the bathroom, to throw trash out, to get water, and sometimes to get internet. Sometimes they have free wi-fi so that's great. Also sometimes they uh, they sell snacks, ice cream, cold drinks, things like that. So I fill up there at the visitor centers. I fill up at Walmarts or at grocery stores at the um, you know those machines where it's like 15 cents or 40 cents a gallon to get to refill your larger jugs of water uh, with nice sparkling clean water. Uh, I do that or sometimes I'll just I'll just buy a new jug of water. I mean these are one or two dollars. They're everywhere at the store so I'll just buy a new one and toss the old one out. I found that I was using plastic bags a lot, Ziploc bags, trash bags, uh, shopping bags, and I wanted a way to organize those and have them handy. So I made this little organizer here. It has one, two, three, four, it has six little rows of pockets. And so in this one, I know that I have trash bags. In this one, I know I have snack sized Ziploc bags. In this one, sandwich sized Ziploc bags. In this one, quart sized freezer bags. In this one, gallon sized freezer or storage bags. And then in this one, I have uh, rolled up shopping bags. And so I know um, where to go for each kind of bag that I need. Uh, a lot of the times, if I'm, if I'm heating up a can of soup, for example, open up the can, toss the, the soup into a pot to heat it up, but then what do I do with the can? I need to make sure it doesn't leak anywhere. And so before I put it into my trash bag, sometimes I'll bag it up into a Ziploc bag uh, before tossing it in there just so it doesn't leak onto my floor or get my seats gross or anything like that. There's not too much going on in the front seat here, in the driver's seat. Um, I have a little, I think it's a two or 300 watt inverter right here that plugs into the into the, the cigarette lighter, the 12 volt socket there. And I use that to charge my phone, to charge my tablet via USB, and also to charge up camera batteries. On the sides of the seat here, I keep my atlases. I have an Arizona State Atlas in here right now. And I have a US Road Atlas on the other side. I use my phone for navigation most of the time. I use just Google Maps if I'm somewhere where I have, uh, have a good signal. If I'm in the middle of nowhere, which happens a lot, or if I'm just driving through a mountainous area and temporarily don't have service, I use a, an app called Here, I think. Here we go, Here Maps. It's a uh, offline turn-by-turn -turn navigation. So you can download an entire state to have offline. So I have um, you know, the states that I go to frequently, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, California, New Mexico, Colorado, all on my phone all the time. So no matter where I am, I can figure out how to get to where I'm going next. And then I also use an app called Gaia GPS when I'm hiking or if I'm on remote um, backwoods roads in the middle of BLM land or national forest somewhere. It's a GPS app, like a GPS hiking app mostly. So I can download USGS topographical maps to it or I can download um, satellite imagery to it also. And that's really helpful when I'm camping or uh, I actually use that map to pinpoint all the places that I'm gonna go uh, on a trip. So I can tell all the places of interest and then also some potential campsites. I use that app for that. I think those are the three main navigation apps that I use. 
And then I have, um, I have a couple more state atlases underneath the seat cover here in a little bag and my laptop is, is stored underneath the seat cover also. I think that a lot of people don't realize how useful it is to have an actual paper map. Uh, I, I love these benchmark state atlases. They're made for all of the states in the western US and they're super helpful for finding a place to camp. They have BLM land boundary markers, private land boundary markers, uh, Native American reservations, forest service land, national monuments, national parks. I'd say that 95% of the time I'm camping where no one else is camping. And I love that, that's how I prefer to do it. And the way I can do that is by looking in my atlases here, finding BLM land or finding national forest land where there isn't anyone else around. This is a 2011 Toyota RAV4. It's not a Jeep, it's not a lifted forerunner. It can't go anywhere that, that I would like to take it, but it can go onto a lot of pretty, pretty gnarly roads. Um, it has, I think, seven and a half inches of ground clearance and it has four wheel drive. So I can go on little back country mining roads, logging roads, no problem. If they are really rocky, that's where I can't go. If there are big rocks and, and boulders in the, in the road, I can't really go down those roads. But overall, I can get to some pretty remote places and uh, gas mileage is much better than it would be on something like a Jeep or a Forerunner. Ostensibly, this gets 26 miles per gallon in the city and 31 miles per gallon on the highway. And I do get about that when the car is empty, when there's nothing on the roof, and when I'm using cruise control on the highway, that's accurate. But when I'm on the trips like this, when I'm going uh, um, slowly down dirt roads, that kills gas mileage. When I'm idling somewhere with the air conditioning on at a Walmart with my laptop, that kills gas mileage. So overall, my daily miles per gallon is around 24. That's what I average um, if you take if you take everything into consideration, I get about 24 miles per gallon. I mentioned using my laptop and I do work when I'm on the road. I'm self-employed. I'm a writer and product designer. And I also have some websites that I make money through um, using affiliate marketing. And so I have my laptop and I'll usually, usually just sit here in the front seat and plug it in at a, at a Walmart or a gas station or a rest stop and uh, I'll need to get online a handful of times per week to make sure everything is going well, to answer emails, and to uh, get kind of a baseline amount of work done. And so out of, a, out of a seven day work week, I might have to work for one or two days out of that week while I'm actually on the road. I tend to take, per year, I'll take maybe one or two month long trips and then several shorter trips ranging from overnight to a week long or two weeks long. So I'm on the road between 70 and 90 nights a year. I do live in a city. I live in, in northern Utah. I have a fiance. I have a business. I have a life that needs to be taken care of. I do still have the flexibility to go wherever I want, whenever I want, as long as I do get, uh, get the baseline amount of work done when I am on these trips. And then before and after the trips, I'm working a lot uh, just to make sure that uh, I, I do have the, the time available to go on these trips. I think that covers everything on the inside of the car. So now let's switch out to the outside. It's different on every trip that I go on. Right now, obviously I have a kayak up here. This is a Pelican Trailblazer 100 kayak. Basically it's the cheapest kayak I could find. It was $188, including tax at Dick's Sporting Goods. So I have that with me on this trip. I don't have it with me on every trip. I brought it on this trip because I spent a couple days kayaking on Lake Powell in Southern Utah. I'm also gonna meet up with a friend on the Colorado River near Moab and do a two night overnight kayak camping trip. The kayak is on these two J racks that I got from Amazon for 20 or $30. Again, I think they were the cheapest ones on Amazon that had relatively good reviews. The kayak is locked to the side rail here with this cable lock to make sure it doesn't, uh, doesn't go anywhere. This right here is the backbone of my budget awning system. This is a piece of, I think one and a half inch ABS pipe maybe about uh, five feet long. I've attached it to the side rail here with some heavy duty 150 pound zip ties, industrial strength zip ties. In the past, I've used uh, hose clamps to attach it to the, to the crossbars up here. But since adding the cargo box and the kayak, there's really no room. I had to move it off to the side. And so I've just attached it with some, with these, uh, with I think four or five heavy duty zip ties. Coming out of the top of the, of the pipe here are three 
small screws. And I have a tarp, a five foot by seven foot tarp. I got it from Walmart, $10. On the short side, on the five foot side, there are three holes, there are three grommets in it. So what I do is just take that short side and drape the grommet holes over each of these three screws. And then I have some wing nuts and I secure the tarp on there with the wing nuts to just screw down and uh, basically clamp that end of the tarp uh, to the car. And then I extend it out and then stake out the corners of the tarp, sometimes with poles, sometimes not. I don't have the tarp awning out all the time. I use it if it's raining because then I can have my window down all the way, uh, but still not get rain inside the window. If it's the middle of the day and it's really sunny, again, I'll put out the, the awning tarp. But if it's toward the end of the day and it's still hot, I'll just pull out my chair and put it in the shade behind behind my car so I don't, I don't have to mess with having the, the awning out. It's just easier to hunker down in the shade of the car. I'll show you the whole awning process and how that works uh, in a minute here. But now let's go over to the other side of the car where the cargo box is. This is a cargo box that I bought used for about $100. I have no idea what the brand is, but uh, it works really well. It takes up just half of the, the roof space on the top of the, of the car, again, so that I can have the kayak up there. If you don't ha have a kayak, then sure, it's great to get one that's, that's the full width. You can, these things can hold a lot of stuff. And so if you're daunted by the prospect of having all this stuff around you inside the car, or if there are two of you inside the car, definitely get one of these things. These things are, are lifesavers. Get a big one. It can hold all your camping gear, uh, hold everything that you need for a trip. So this cargo box holds a few different things. Uh, as I mentioned before, I have an online store where I sell things that I make. And so that still needs to operate when I'm on the road on a month long trip like this. And so inside here, I have four plastic bins that hold the inventory and also the shipping supplies. And so those four bins take up about this much space in here. And then for the rest of the space, I have a kayak paddle, my life vest for when I'm kayaking. I have an inner tube in here. This is where my dirty clothes bag is. If I fill up the trash bag that's in here, I'll tie it up, toss it up in here. Again, this thing holds a lot of stuff. I'm really happy with it. This is actually the first extended trip I've taken with it. And I wish I'd gotten one sooner. The cargo box is attached to the stock roof rack that came on the RAV4, and it's attached with the stock, the stock hardware that came with the cargo box when I bought it. And I bought this particular cargo box because it was relatively flat on top. I think this is an older cargo box. A lot of the new ones are a little bit more aerodynamic and are more dome shaped on the top, but this one is flat and I wanted that so that I could mount the solar panel on the top. The solar panel is a 100 watt Renogy solar panel. It's attached to the top of the cargo box with four aluminum Z brackets that I got off of Amazon for I think $10 for the pair or for the, for the set of four. I drilled holes into the top of the cargo box and used stainless steel hardware to attach the Z brackets to the top of the cargo box. I also have some rubber washers on here to, uh, to A, to kind of try to dissipate the load a little bit because these cargo boxes are heavy duty enough, but they're not, uh, they're, they're not bomb proof. You can't put too much stress on them. So I wanted to distribute the load. So I have some washers and some, some rubber washers to help with that. And I haven't had any problems with water leaking into the cargo box. It's, it's stayed pretty, pretty airtight. On this trip so far, I think I've gone maybe 1500 miles with the cargo box up here. I wasn't entirely certain that it wouldn't rip the top of the cargo box off but I figured that it'd be worth a try because if it did work, it would be really helpful and really useful. And so far, so good. I haven't had any problems with it. Doesn't make any, any wind noise. Uh, the, the solar panel doesn't make any crazy wind noise or anything like that. There's maybe an inch or two of space between the top of the cargo box and the bottom of the solar panel. A lot of people, when they're setting up their solar systems on their van, they'll drill holes in the top of their car. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to touch this thing. I want it to be basically as stock as possible so that if I need to, I can resell it and not have to explain why there's a quarter inch or three eighths inch hole in the roof of my car. And so to do that, I thought about having the cables just uh, running on the inside of the door so I could basically just close the door on the cables. But that kinked the cables in a weird way that I wasn't really comfortable with. What I've ended up doing is having the, the window rolled down maybe 
a quarter of an inch, half an inch max, and then running the cables through that. Because I have these little visor things on the, on the top of each of my windows, it protects rain from, from getting in, uh, in through the, through the little opening, but uh, the cables can still fit there. And it's, I have enough kind of loose slack wire in the system up here so that when I open the door, it doesn't get too tight. It's not pulling the wires anywhere. And the wire comes through here, through the, uh, th through the corner of the open window. And I can still have my, my mosquito netting up here magneted on to the, to the side so that it doesn't interfere with that either. And then the solar comes down into my, my battery bank down there. I think I left the cables on here at about 10 or 12 feet long. If I needed to, if I were parked in the shade for a long time, I could take the panel off, move the panel uh, into the sun and then still be parked in the shade. I haven't really run into that problem yet. I haven't needed to do that yet, but it is an option. Also between trips, if I want to take the solar panel off, I figure it would take maybe 10 minutes to remove the screws and, and pull the thing off. Uh, nothing is permanent. It's not glued anywhere. There's no adhesive Velcro or adhesive tape anywhere. It's all very uh, temporary so I can easily add and remove it from the car if I need to. The cables here go down into my battery bank, which is just a, like a $5 Tupperware plastic box from Walmart. Uh, that's where I put my batteries and all the other electronics. I have two 35 amp hour batteries that are wired together, so I have 70 amp hours of power. I have a, I think it's a 400 watt inverter. I have a cheapo $20 solar charge controller from Amazon. I did a lot of research when I was building this. I, I don't know anything about electronics. And so I watched just all the YouTube videos I could find on how to make a little portable solar generator or an ammo can or ammo box generator. That's what a lot of people do. And so I just did, uh, did the best I could by following people, other people's instructions and then what, just what seemed to make sense to me. And it works really well. Uh, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Those 70 amp hours of battery have been more than enough for me combined with the 100 watt panel. I use this basically to run my laptop when I'm working so that I don't need to run the car if I don't have to. Sometimes if it's really hot, I'll have the car running just for the air conditioning. But if I don't need to, it's nice to just at the end of the day at my campsite where it's nice and quiet, just have the, the car off and then I can pull out my laptop, plug it into the inverter here, flip the switch on the inverter and be on my laptop. I don't know how long I could charge my laptop for. I'm guessing that you could probably run my laptop all day for a day or two if I needed it to. I've never even come close to maxing out the, the battery on it. I also use it for my fan. I have a little USB powered fan that I have plugged into it. I use it to charge my phone at night and to charge my tablet at night if I need to. And again, it's, it's more than enough power for me. I haven't even come close to maxing it out. Let me know if you have any questions about the solar. I know that uh, when I was trying to figure it out for myself, it would have been nice to have someone who knew at least a little bit more than I did about what to ask about. And so if you do have any questions, I'm not an expert, but I'm happy to help. Just leave a question in the comments and I'll answer it. You can also send me an email, go to suvrving.com. You can use the contact form there. I'm also on social media, mostly on Instagram. I'm SUVRVing on Instagram. Basically, if you just Google SUVRVing, you'll find my YouTube channel, which is actually my main focus right now. So if you like learning how to, how to camp and, and travel in an SUV, I have a bunch of videos on that. I also have a bunch of videos about my adventures. I tend to go to pretty remote places and I climb big mountains and go on big hikes and explore places that, uh, that a lot of people don't go to. I've been traveling around the Western US for the better part of 10 years and so I've been to a lot of the more popular places so I tend to go to more obscure places so if you're into that check out my channel and uh, send me a note if you have any questions about that. I think that's everything on the inside and outside of car so now I'll show you how I really set up camp when I pull up to a campsite that I like what goes into all the different pieces and setting up camp itself. Usually the first thing I set up when I get to a campsite is my chair just because even if I'm not cooking or anything like that I just want to be able to relax outside so the chair is usually always the, the first thing to go up. Yep. 
by now it probably won't come as a surprise that I modified the chair a little bit. So I added a pocket on the side and sewed a loop on the back of it so I can clip the bag to the back just to keep everything together. A little table is next and this thing was like 20 or $30 on Amazon. It's a cheap little Chinese made table but I like it a lot. I don't use this table, pull it out every time I camp or even every time I cook. Sometimes I cook on it, sometimes I don't. I have a few different cooking surfaces that I'll, I'll show you, but uh, if I feel like sitting in the chair and just relaxing, and I still need to cook something or make a sandwich, then I'll, I'll pull this out, so. In a week, in a week of camping, I'll probably have this little table out four or five out of the seven days. And so I can sit here and cook and prepare food, or I can just use it as a, as a foot rest. When I pull out my kitchen bin here, the table is often a good place to set it. Especially if I'm cooking on one of the other surfaces that I have. I, uh, I put the, the kitchen box on the table so that I can, so it's not on the floor so ants and bugs aren't crawling into it, but I can still, uh, still reach it while I'm doing other things. So this is just a little Crazy Creek camp chair. I don't really use this at camp, but I do use it when I'm sitting inside sometimes. If I'm sitting up, I can just set this on my mattress and sit in it and then uh, use this table surface here as a desk or as a table to I can put my laptop here, I can write here, and uh, just use this as back support. But generally I don't use this, I just have it as an option if I need to. So this is a little hanging table that I made. I wanted to be able to prepare food or cook food while I was standing up. So I can adjust the height of this to, uh, again, prepare food if I'm cooking on the little table, or if I'm cooking here, I can put my stove up here and cook on it here. This is my little privacy tent, my little shower tent. It's a pop-up tent. Again, I think it was about 20 or $30 on Amazon. And then I have a, a hatchet in the back here that I use to pound in the, the tent stakes to make sure it doesn't fly away in the wind. If I'm camping somewhere and there are other people around and I need to take a shower or go to the bathroom, I'll set this thing up. But if I'm in the middle of nowhere, if I'm all alone and showering, I won't bother with it. I used to have a much larger, like a room sized tent that I would take with me on my travels, but I realized that A, it was just a pain to deal with in my car because it was so huge. And B, because I used it so rarely, it just wasn't worth having. But this one, doesn't really take up much space as long as you have a good spot for it, which I do. And I think it's really handy. And as you saw, it sets up in two seconds. It's harder to take it down. If you don't know how to do it, it's kind of a pain to take it back down. But once you do it a few times, it's second nature and it's, it's pretty easy to do. This is hard ground here. And I modified this too. I added these little orange tie outs on the corners because when it's really windy, the wind will blow it over, but I can just attach some cord to each corner and stake out, tie out each corner, and then it'll stand up to the winds. I just sewed these on, these little loops on. And then up on the top here, there used to be some ceiling of mosquito netting. I found that after I showered, tons of flies would fly in because it was a cool place, shaded and moist, I guess. And so I would have just dozens of flies trapped up here. It's really weird. And so I figured I would just cut out the top and haven't had any problems like that since then. And as far as modifying gear goes, like I know some people are hesitant about cutting something off or adding a loop on, but like the gear is here to serve my purpose. I'm not here to do whatever the gear wants me to do. I want things to be how I want them to be. So I have no problem with modifying gear if I think it'll improve the product and make it better and more useful for me. So this is my kitchen box in here. I have 
a bag of a bag of longer utensils, a couple fuel canisters, a small little camp size pot that has a couple of insulated mugs in it. I have a much larger a much larger pot with a strainer inside, a colander inside. That's held in the lid of it. It's held on with a bungee cord, a plate, a cutting board. Uh, pretty standard stuff. And then the stove that I have. I really like this stove. It's made by Gas One. Again, got it off Amazon, thirty or forty dollars. The great thing about this stove is that it's dual fuel, so it can run off of the green propane canisters or butane canisters. The butane canisters fit right in here. The propane canisters are attached with this hose that comes with it. Great little stove. If I'm boiling water for tea or hot chocolate or something, I'll set the stove on the table, stick the, uh, the butane can in, lock it in place, And then toss it on there. It's really easy to start. Starts with a click. It has built-in ignition in it and that works really well. I don't really like to cook. I don't cook if I can help it. In a week of camping I will pull out the stove probably three or four times during the week for dinner. If it's really cold outside I'll pull it out more in the mornings. I'll make some warm oatmeal or make some warm tea in the morning to, to help warm me up. Generally I try to avoid cooking if I can. It also depends on my mood. If I'm tired of eating burritos and, and hamburgers from fast food restaurants, I'll make some pasta. I might just spend a day in one spot at camp and cook a meal that'll last me for three or four days. As far as dishes go, I have one plate that I use. Then I usually will just wipe it clean with a paper towel and, or spray it with my little water bottle. As far as bowls go, I have some paper bowls that uh, are in one of these other bins that I'll use to make things like oatmeal. If I need for silverware, I have some just disposable ones. Basically, I don't like to do dishes. I don't like to wash dishes. I have in the past, I've had a little spray bottle that has a solution of half water, half vinegar in it, and apparently that works well for uh, for just spraying down the, the dirty dishes and then wiping them clean. I found that I didn't really even need to do that. I think that just the paper plates and uh, paper bowls and disposable cutlery is, is the easiest way to go for me. So we've covered me using the little table for, for cooking. Sometimes I'll use this for cooking or preparing food. If it's really windy, I'll cook inside of the car, but I don't like doing that often if I don't need to because uh, I just don't want my car to smell like cooking food. So sometimes I will put this wooden, this is actually just a wooden cutting board that I've used here. I'll put this on the front seat and put, uh, put the stove on top of it. I, I can just prepare food on the front seat there. I can also use this space here for cooking and preparing food. I'll put whatever is left in this spot over on top of these so this area is free and clear. And then I can just prepare my food, cut up food or, or cook as I need to. On the little shelf here. I'd say that I cook on the little table probably 40% of the time, on the hanging side table 20% of the time, and then the rest of the time is split between cooking inside, usually in the back here, but if it's really windy or depending on which direction the wind is coming from, sometimes it makes more sense to cook in the front seat. Thanks for following along with this little tour of my adventure mobile. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. You can email me uh, by going to my website, suvrving.com, and using the contact form there. I have a book called SUV RVing. Just search for that on Amazon. And then I have a YouTube channel, SUV RVing, and a, an Instagram account, again, SUV RVing. Uh, if you just go to suvrving.com, that'll redirect you to all the, all the important places, uh, or just Google it, and, and you'll find, find me that way. 